Thank you. Okay, we're pretty much halfway through, and uh, what I'm going to do is briefly reiterate what I covered already. Uh, teachers know they have to repeat things. Uh, you have to hear something usually more than once to really retain it. Uh, I would hope that you'll be uh, interested in this material. It is essential material con concerning uh, what our faith teaches us and what we have to live. And um, it behooves us to learn it and then, of course, to live it. Uh, this is uh, the series is being uh, videotaped. Uh, my office will have that uh, probably within uh, a few weeks or so. Uh, that's a, a, a valuable tool. Uh, technology is essential. The church has mandated that we use the means of social communication, television, radio, DVDs, CDs, internet. Um, that's not an option. The church has mandated that we use these means to spread the gospel uh, and, and to uh, help people to learn their faith. So. Uh, you know, the DVDs or CDs, either one, you can play it over and over and over again, and after you've looked at it or listened to it for the 16th time, you'll probably uh, retain it permanently. Uh, I read that someplace once, that you have to hear something 16 times <laughs> in order to uh, permanently retain it. I don't know if it takes that many, but it usually more than once for most of us. So. We covered some of the basics, the, uh, the basic principles we use in Catholic social teaching, the major themes of Catholic social teaching, uh, the principles, human dignity, leading off solidarity, charity, subsidiarity, distributism. Those are the five uh, principles, major principles that are involved with Catholic teaching. Then the key themes, there are seven key themes in Catholic social teaching. First, the sanctity of human life and the dignity of the person. Second, the call to family, community, and participation. Uh, then rights and responsibilities, the two go hand in hand, of course. And then four, the preferential option for the poor and the, and the vulnerable. We are our brother's keeper. We have to be concerned about other people, especially when they're disadvantaged, when they're poor, when they're sick, um, when they're in need of help. We, we have to be concerned about them. Fifth, the dignity of work and the rights of workers. Um, work is an ennobling thing. Remember, uh, Jesus, after he assumed his human nature, um, he, he, uh, <laughs> he worked. You know, he, he was a carpenter, right? He did manual labor. So uh, if, if it's not uh, something that's, uh, that, that the Lord of all creation uh, would, would despise to do, I mean, if good enough for him, it's good enough for us. Work is an essential thing. <clears throat> you have to work in order to feel good about yourself. Now, some people say, and, and I understand this, after you've worked 40 or 50 years, you say, well, I'm ready to retire, and that's understandable, but you did, you work. You know, it's not like you didn't do anything your whole life. But I'll tell you this much, if you retire and do nothing, that won't be good. Probably that, you know, you've got to have something to do, some <clears throat> charitable work, a part-time job, at, at least recreational activities that, that absorb you, uh, something intellectual, reading. You can't do nothing. You just have to keep active. Fifth, solidarity. Remember, we're, we're all part of the same human family. We're all related with the same Father. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And then seventh, care for God's creation. Uh, it's, it's so important. All of this goes together. All right, th these aren't a bunch of disparate, unrelated parts. These are all 
interrelated. Everything that I talked about, every theme, every principle, every dimension of the truth is a dimension of the same one truth. They're compenetrated, as it were. Something that you have to come back to, I think, over and over and over again. Um, the church gives us this wonderful uh, social doctrine, and it is a body of doctrine, but constantly I feel the need to come back. I guess it's from my training in philosophy. Uh, one thing that I learned in uh, my studies in philosophy, uh, especially um, with metaphysics, uh, you try to go to the order of causes. Very often what we see in life is effects. It's like if you're a physician, um, somebody comes in and they present with certain symptoms. Uh, I have a headache. I have this, uh, okay, the symptom. What you have to do is you try, you have to get to the underlying cause that's resulting in those symptoms. We can look at society and say, aha, society's sick. We see certain symptoms that manifest that, that tip us off that there's an illness in process here. It's not healthy. Uh, we see millions of abortions. That's a symptom. We see things like um, euthanasia. That, that there's something wrong with a, a um, society that wants to euthanize people. It may be well-meaning, you know, merciful death is what euthanasia means. When I was walking, or I, I guess it was on the screen earlier uh, in the room where we are in between, uh, I saw the picture of Terry Schiavo, okay? Uh, when Terry Schiavo was going through that ordeal that was pretty much nationally known, uh, Pope John Paul II on the other side of the ocean was dying at the same time. He was just as helpless as she was at that point. Now, he was at the end of his life, and he was ill. She wasn't. They killed her. In plain English, don't let fuzzy thinking cloud your judgment. Yes, no one likes to see another person suffer. I don't. You know, I, 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 I don't want to, and, and it is a terrible thing, and I sympathize with families uh, who, who have to see their loved ones suffer. Believe me, I've seen plenty of it as a priest. I've been in plenty of rooms with people dying from cancer and AIDS and other things. I've been in plenty of rooms with elderly people uh, passing away as their spouse held their hand. I've been in plenty of those rooms. I've been in children's hospitals many, many times. If you ever start feeling sorry for yourself, go visit a children's hospital and spend some time walking around in there and you'll find out what suffering's about. You, you, you know, and it's the children are one thing, their families are another. Uh, t terrible suffering. But you know, we, we, can, we look at society, like, look like a physician. You see the symptoms, all the attacks on life, uh, the degeneration of the moral fabric of society, and that manifests itself in so many different ways. You see, now just think about it, just in the last few years, we have had a, an exponential increase in disasters, I don't just mean natural disasters, um, uh, professions, loss of confidence in corporate leadership, loss of confidence in political leadership, loss of conf confidence every place you look, loss of confidence in the church, right, with the scandals, you know, it, it, it disheartened us. Sometimes made us angry, made us, certainly made us sad. All of this, these symptoms, these are symptoms of an underlying moral illness that afflicts mankind. 
all of the divisions, as I said before, all of, all of that disintegration, that can all be traced back. Like if you're a physician, you're trying to diagnose. You should, and, and this is a philosophical thing. So you can't, frequently, you can't immediately know a cause except by reasoning back from the effects, back to the cause. You see all of these effects, symptom, and then if you have wisdom, you can reason back to the underlying cause, the underlying division that's the cause of all divisions, the underlying disease which is the cause of all the symptoms of society's illness. That's in individual human beings. The church can give us all of these wonderful documents, all of this beautiful teaching, but if individual human persons don't have the capacity to grasp it, if they can't see it, if they don't have eyes for truth and ears for truth, they won't get it, and it will be for naught. And so all the social teaching of the church, all the teaching of the church in general, doctrine, moral teaching, you have to have ears to hear and eyes to see. And there is only one way that that can happen. It's called a state of grace. You have to cultivate a state of grace. One way of saying, what is a state of grace? Well, sanctifying grace is a share in divine life. How do you get it? Well, originally through baptism. That's where we first receive sanctifying grace. And then that sanctifying grace stays with us. Uh, a, a good, uh, simple definition of it is a, a share in divine life. So we become united with God. The, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dwell within us as in a temple so long as we persevere in a state of grace. What, what can change that? Mortal sin. Okay? Serious sin extinguishes the life of grace in the soul. It cuts you off from God until you repent of it, until you're healed of that. Uh, that's why we have confession. That's what repentance is about. But unless that is in place in individual human beings, then none of the rest of this is going to make any difference. We have an obligation to teach it. We have an obligation to present it. We have an obligation to, in a sense, lobby for it in society and try to uh, enable it as best we can. But you cannot give what you do not have. That's a, a, there's an old axiom. Every priest learned that in Latin in the old days. Nemo dat quod non habit. And basically it means you, you can't give what you don't have. So how are you going to hand on to your children what you don't have? How are you going to hand on to society what you yourself don't have? And so, and the answer to that is, well, you can't. So you have to ensure that you yourself get it, then you can hand it on to your children. And when I present to you the social teaching of the church or any teaching of the church, you're well disposed. Why? You're, 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 you're in a state of grace, hopefully, or at least you're, you're, you want to move towards that. You're humble enough to acknowledge that you're not perfect, you're a sinner. If you need to go to confession, you'll do so. God knows the heart. And then he will give you light to see in an increasingly dark world. And trust me, it's going to get darker. And you can say, oh, he's a pessimist. No, I'm not a pessimist. I am a realist. And that's what is well underway. And you have to be ready for it. You know, that, that's uh, a soldier who goes on the battlefield without acknowledging the existence of the enemy. He's not a very good soldier. You know, the, the, the uh, army equips him with all the best technology, the best weapons, and he forgets them. And he walks out on the battlefield basically naked, unprotected, and unarmed. Whose fault is that? His fault. He was armed, he was prepared, he was trained. Well, if the enemy doesn't exist, who needs weapons, right? 
If the enemy doesn't exist, who needs tactics? You don't need anything. You just walk around like there is no enemy. There is no war. And what happens to you? You're dead meat in plain English. And that's what has happened. You look at our country. Look at the world. The Christian West. Christianity was asleep. Most of us were asleep the last two, three decades. I don't mean you personally, but I mean in general. This couldn't have happened if we were vigilant, if we were vibrant in our faith. If we're not even going to church, what are we doing? If you're not in a state of grace, you're like a dead soldier on the battlefield. Because another way of explaining being in a state of grace is you're alive in Christ. If you're not in a state of grace, the life of grace has been extinguished in your soul. In other words, you're dead. A dead soldier laying on the battlefield is not going to take the fight to the enemy. He's dead. If you are dead in sin, you will not be a force for the kingdom. And so, first and foremost, You've got to strive for personal holiness. Otherwise, all this talk about the social teaching of the church is an exercise in futility because it will avail us nothing. So probably the best thing a person uh, could do, uh, and I, I, I don't know, maybe I'll come to it someday. I think this is a useful thing to do. It's necessary to do. But I remember what happened to Archbishop Fulton Sheen in his day. You know, um, you know, for a while there, although he was the most famous preacher in the Catholic Church back in the, in the 20th century, he was somewhat marginalized for a while. He, he was kind of rejected for a while. Uh, he was even um, punished in a sense, by his bishop for a while. Why? Well, jealousy, basically. He didn't do anything wrong. Took him off television. Why? Well, for a long time, Bishop Sheen was on television, and oh, he had tens of millions of viewers every Sunday night on national television. And um, he was arguably next to the Pope, maybe the most influential person in the Catholic Church for a while. Millions of dollars would come in from corporation presidents, boards of directors, and so forth for the various charitable works in the Catholic Church, and Bishop Sheen would direct them. And um, then he was named to be the um, director of the Society for the Propagation of the Faith. And he'd be on television, and he would talk about that and missionary work, basically. And people would send in large sums of money, you know. It, uh, when you have millions and millions and millions of people watching you every week, and you're good at what you do, uh, that's, there's a certain power in that. And, and he never misused it. He, he channeled it in the right direction. Then one day, was, the cardinal that was his boss, basically, uh, said, well, where's my cut? because he had always gotten for that archdiocese a percentage of the money that came in. He said, well, I can't give you this, Bishop Sheen said. I can't do that because it's, people are giving it for the Society for the Propagation of the Faith, so I can't divert, you know, that's, okay, get off television. So he did. He was obedient. And then he spent the last years of his life doing one thing, trying to get priests to make a holy hour. Another way of saying that is trying to get priests to be holy. So I guess what I'm getting at is, is I'm trying to say that you've got to go to the order of causes before the effects can be dealt with. Um, all these negative effects we see in society, um, abortion, euthanasia, pornography, um, corruption, uh, the abuse of the environment, uh, human trafficking, you know, so many different things that are so wrong and so against the Catholic Church's social teaching. 
These will not be remedied merely by talking about it. We have a body of doctrine, the social teaching of the church, that's essential, that's great. But it won't happen until one at a time we enter into personal holiness. You will not be able to do this or even agree with some of this stuff unless you are affected by grace in such a way that you can move with this. So, the social teaching of the church. It is ancient and it's new. Ever ancient, ever new. It's biblical, certainly. The roots of it are in Scripture. Uh, as we've said, that passage I started with, and come back to it in your mind over and over again, whenever you think about the social teaching of the church, insofar as you did it for the least of my brethren, you did it for me, we must have concern for the poor, the underprivileged, the disenfranchised, those who are down on their luck, even if it's their own fault, the drug addict, the alcoholic, the street person. How can I do that, you say? Remember this. Every human being is made in the image and likeness of God. That's where their dignity lies. It's innate. The dignity is innate, inherent in every human being. So when I see that person that I may not like, that person that may disgust me, that person that aggravates me, that person that really makes me angry, that person that's taking my hard-earned money, you've got to see Jesus. You have to see Jesus in every human being. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation? Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. We're created in the image of God. What's the image of God? Jesus. Nobody knows the Father except through the Son. How, how can you see God by seeing Jesus? How do we know God through his Son? In the eternal silences of the Trinity, God our Father spoke but one word, his only word, Jesus. He has no more to say. Those are the inspired words of the great doctor of the church, St. John of the Cross. Jesus is the way that we know God. By studying the word of God, by absorbing the word of God, by becoming one with the word of God, we're filled with Jesus, and then we're enabled through him in the power of the Spirit to do the Father's will. What's that? Well, everything I told you in the, the church's social teaching. I'm enabled to love God with my whole heart, mind, and strength, and I am able to love my neighbor out of, as myself out of love for God. Charity. Okay? It's the only way you can do it. You won't do it. The politicians babble on incessantly and say nothing. They talk and they talk and they talk and they talk and they say nothing. And very few of them are motivated by anything good. When I studied philosophy, of course we studied ancient philosophy, we studied the writings of Plato and, you know, through Socrates, you know, it was very interesting. One of the things that you learned about <clears throat> was about the sophists. You know what a sophist is? Oh, you need to know what a sophist is, especially today. Sophists were a certain um, a group of people, a vo let's, let, what can we call it, a vocation perhaps? They, they a certain occupation. Sophists were professional speakers. Sophists basically were orators who would get up and address crowds of people like this. 
and they spoke eloquently, flowery, mm, erudite, educated, smooth. <laughs> One time a bishop said to me after I had wreaked havoc in a parish, he said, uh, now John, I want you to be smooth. <laughs> I laughed so hard. Smooth? Moi? You want me to be smooth? I can't. I don't know how. But the Soffits knew how. They were smooth, sophisticated, educated, and they would talk, and the pseudo-sophisticated, pseudo-educated audience would say, ah, oh, doesn't Sophocles speak marvelously well? And some old farmer would say, oh yeah, what did he say? <laughs> Nobody knew. Why? Because he didn't say anything. He just babbled on. A bunch of nice, smooth-sounding words came out, and they didn't mean anything. And they didn't, they didn't have the power to change anything. Rhetoric. Empty rhetoric. That sound familiar? That strike a chord of recognition? Resonate at some level in your contemporary experience? Yeah, definitely. You know, we, we, we need to be like the level-headed, down-to-earth old farmer who isn't influenced by nonsense. You know, if you're going to talk, say something. I, I remember uh, uh, Bishop Sheen, uh, who in a way was my mentor, he told a story about how in his early years, when he uh, finished his doctorate, he was teaching a class of deacons in England. And uh, he, was, uh, give, he was holding forth a, a theological exposition on theandric actions. Now, theandric action, it, uh, theandric is a a Greek word that combines two words, the word for God and the word for man. A theandric action is an action of the God-man, Jesus Christ. Jesus, divine person, acting through his human nature. And so Bishop Sheen held forth in his most erudite fashion, and he could do it. Uh, he was an extremely educated man. He, he was very, very uh, eloquent. And so he uh, gave this class to the deacons, and afterwards, one of the deacons came up to him and said, Ah, oh, Dr. Sheen, Dr. Sheen, positively brilliant, positively brilliant. And Bishop Sheen said, Oh, yeah, what did I say? And he said, Well, I don't quite know. <laughs> yeah, and Bishop Sheen said, And I don't either. And he vowed at that point that he would never try to sound erudite and sophisticated and educated. Because that, that, that doesn't count for anything. What matters is that they get it. The teacher's job is to speak in a fashion so that they get it. If the teacher becomes an obstacle to intelligibility, he can't teach. She can't teach. You have to be transparent. In other words, the words you use, what you express should be true. It should be clear. The truth is pure intelligibility. God is pure intelligibility, not to us, because we try to complicate the matter. But in himself, he's pure intelligibility, pure light. The problem is, when, when you try to pass the pure light from one person to another, frequently that person gets in the way and obfuscates the transmission of light. Arrogance is one of the things that, that'll do that, or duplicity, you know? Uh, the politicians, they, they try to sound good. Oh, I want to do everything to help you. I want to give you this, and I want to give you that, and I want to give you this, and I'm going to do this and that and the other thing. <clears throat> you know, after a point, I, the older I've gotten, I guess the more, uh, it's hard, the harder it is to convince me. You know, kind of, you don't like to get cynical but uh, or jaded. However, you know, kind of like uh, Missouri, right? Show me. The show me state. Okay, you talk a good story. Yeah, show me. 
Oh, you're going you're gonna to fix the economy? Okay, great, show me. What's the plan? Okay, uh, there, there is, there's a problem with health care, and there is, and there needs to be something done, absolutely. How will you do that? How will it be better? Hmm, millions, 10 million illegal immigrants. Who are they? I don't know. Where are they? I don't know. What are they doing? I don't know. You assume that everything's okay, like my chemistry professor said, you, and then you make an ASS out of you and me. And you wonder why then the country subverted, the economy tanks, and everything goes wrong. And it seems like everything they do is like putting rocket fuel onto a fire. It gets worse and worse and worse. And that's the way it's going to do until they start paying attention to these principles of the church's social teaching. And they won't unless they are motivated and inspired and filled with grace. Another way to say this, a, a, a way to live, put God first. I'm giving you practical advice now. We've been talking about you know, the, all these elements of the church's social teaching. This is just simple, simple practical advice. Put God first. God first. Your neighbor second, right? What's the first commandment? Love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, and strength. God first. What's the second? Well, it's like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself out of love for God. And put yourself last. What happens then? The fulfillment of a divine promise. The last become first. Now, how, how can you put into practice the social teaching of the Catholic Church, this body of doctrine that, that we're mandated to accept? Only if I put God first. How do I do that? I pray. I'm a spiritual person. I go to Mass. I sell, I'm, I'm involved in the life of the Church. Go to confession. Go to Mass, receive Holy Communion, pray every day, pray the Rosary every day. You know, people say, oh, I like to pray. I don't like the Rosary. I pray in other words. Yeah, great. But I often find that they don't. But if you pray the Rosary, that's kind of like a, a, a well-defined thing. And, you, and you're probably not going to do better than that on your own. You want to pray on your own? Good, do it. But do that too. Rosary is the prayer of the gospel. You're not going to do better than the gospel. How is it the prayer of the gospel? The body and soul of the rosary is it's the gospel. Well, what do you mean? Well, I, the, the meditation on the 20 mysteries, where do those mysteries come from? Scripture, mostly the gospel. The Our Father, where does that come from? The gospel. The Hail Mary, where does that come from? The gospel. The prayer of the rosary is gospel prayer. What's the gospel? The good news. What's the good news? Jesus Christ. Pray the rosary. You're praying Jesus. You interiorize Christ. You become who you are, the body of Christ, empowered to do the work of Christ. And the work of Christ is this social teaching of the Catholic Church. That's how you do it. That's the only way you can do it. So be a spiritual person first and foremost. Then you will have the power to do the rest of it. You know, it's like, you know, you don't put the cart before the horse. Uh, we, I can present all of this social teaching of the church, but if the spiritual part is not in place first in the individual human being, then this just falls on deaf ears or, or the person just doesn't have the power to carry it out. And, and we need to, and we need to do this, by the way, uh, very, very quickly, because things are unraveling uh, in a hurry, I'm afraid. All right, we've got, now I'm going to cover in a little more depth, the principles of Catholic social teaching, which I went through before, but I'll try to now go back and take a little more time 
with each one. There's only five of them, only five, uh, but every one of them is of enormous importance. And I know that I am saying the same thing more than once, many times, and I'm doing that on purpose. That's not inadvertent. It's like, I don't, don't think that, well, he keeps repeating himself. He wants to. <laughs> That's all. I have to. Why? Because if you don't get it, I'm a failure. That's why. You know, if the teacher doesn't transmit the material to the student, the teacher hasn't done it, right? So I have to, there has to be a certain amount of repetition, and there has to be a certain amount of memorization. Remember in the old days how we used to have to memorize stuff in school? Okay, somehow we got away from that, uh, much to the detriment of education and individual human beings, by the way. Now, I'm not saying memorization is everything. It's not, because, uh, you know, you can memorize something, rote memorization, and, and never interiorize it. So you can memorize the Ten Commandments, which you should do, but unless you interiorize the Ten Commandments, you haven't really finished the job. Uh, we can memorize the social teaching of the Catholic Church, the major themes, the major principles, but unless we interiorize those principles and themes, then basically we're just in potential and not actualized in that knowledge. So it's, it's very important to, to carry through. The way to do that is to your spiritual life. Uh, and, and this is important. You know, you good people are like God's special forces. There are not a lot of you. Now, there are a lot of you in this auditorium right now, several thousand, and that's a good thing. But when you put that in the context of the entire world, several billion people with a B, you will see that like Gideon's army, we are outnumbered. That's okay. That's okay. That, that's like, uh, you know, I love some of the... Uh, some of the stories from uh, military history, they're just, they're, they're great. Some of the battles that, that have taken place where armies were hopelessly outnumbered and uh, the attitude was, well, we're, but, but General, we're, they have 100,000 troops. We only have 1,000. And, you know, a, a response, something, to the effect of, well, you know, it's like maybe we should spot them some troops or something like that. You know, they're disadvantaged. They're, they, they're only outnumbers 100 to 1. Poor things. They're in trouble. I've got them right where I want them. That's the attitude we have to have. Yes, you are outnumbered, but we, every one of you is important. You've got to learn this stuff. You've got to know this. Oh, I'm too young, Father. I'm too old, Father. I don't care if you're 8 or 80. Learn it. And then live it. Because if you don't, your unique, precious, unrepeatable place on the battle line is left vacant. And that battle space will be overrun by the enemy. Why? Because you weren't at your post. That's why. It is incumbent upon every one of us to take this seriously. At this critical juncture in the history of the world, we have to know this and we have to live this. It's going to be over soon. It's going to be over soon. Don't worry. And then every tear will be wiped away. Learn these principles. Human dignity, remember, again, I'm going over and over again, but I have to. All of this begins with God, and then the human person made in the image and likeness of God. Human beings, I, I wish I could say something brilliant or inspired to make you realize 
how precious every human being is. From, from the, the baby in the womb, four minutes old, from the moment of conception, human being, unique, precious, unrepeatable. It's not a potential human being. It's a human being with potential. From the moment of conception, never forget that. And that human being must be accorded all the dignity of any human being. If it's not human from the moment of conception, it will never be human. It's something else. Then, then, you're, then it's a banana or, or a rabbit or a tree. But you, no. But if it's a human being, if it's in the human mother's womb, that is a human being. It must be accorded the full dignity of any human being. People that are challenged in some way, uh, handicapped is a word that, that, that's been used, um, they are fully human and must be accorded the full dignity of human persons. They have to be. You know, that, that haunting picture of Terry Shamo that we all have seen many, many times. She wasn't sick. They killed her. And the blood of the innocent on the hands of society. Every human being, from the youngest to the oldest, even if they're sick, that makes them less dignified as a human being. We should love them less. Let me tell you something. That's where this is going. You watch what happens. Well, you know, it, it costs so much to take care of an old person. You know, it's your duty to die. They have actually said this in other countries now where some of this misguided health care is going on. Now, once again, don't misunderstand me. I am for health care for every human being. Every one of us, that's one of the rights a person has, the right to be treated medically. If you're sick, you should be helped. You should have access to medical care, and it shouldn't bankrupt you either. I'm all for that. I, I think we should have that. But if the government does it, I question their ability to do it. Why? I don't see them as being a moral force to be reckoned with. They're driven by dollars and cents and self, you know. Well, uh, you know, it costs uh, so many th thousands of dollars, though, to take care of that old person. The older they get, and you know, with the good medicine and so forth, they could live another 10 or 20 years. Good! Good. Well, yeah, but they're not productive. No, that's because you're stupid. <laughs> if you had eyes to see, you would know they are more productive. I'm thinking about bringing out my doctoral thesis in print. I, I, it was published at the university when I did it, but it's never been made available for general consumption. It was on the mystery of suffering in the teaching of Pope John Paul II. And the bottom line was this. I spent three years of my life, day and night, researching the Church's teaching, especially Pope John Paul II, on the meaning of human suffering. Human suffering, whatever form it takes, uh, whether it's physical illness, injury, infirmity, just getting older, you can't see like you used to, you can't hear like you used to, you can't walk as good as you used to, you're not as strong or agile as you used to be. That's difficult. Emotional struggles, depression, anxiety. You know, the, the biggest selling pharmaceutical in the world is antidepressants, which tells you something about the state of the world. That's suffering, and it's intense suffering, too. 
physical suffering, emotional suffering, moral suffering. People suffer morally. Well, they're sinning. They have free will. They could stop. There are people that are so bound in sin, they hate the sin. And they can't stop because they're enslaved to the sin. That's all the forms of suffering has a potential for good. Jesus assumed a human nature, it was a perfect human nature, a human nature without sin, and he took it to a cross. Because of that, all humanity is caught up in Christ and has the potential to enter into redemptive suffering through him, with him, and in him. No human suffering is useless. No pain, no rejection, no persecution, no emotional struggle. None of it's useless if you lift it up in Christ. You have the capacity to contribute to the salvation of your brothers and sisters. You can help them get to heaven in Jesus. That's why we're all valuable. That's why elderly people are valuable. That's why their life is not useless just because they can't do work in a factory at the age of 80. Are they in a bed suffering? Are they useless? No. To be lifted up on the cross of Christ is to be set at the pinnacle of human possibilities for the simple reason that no greater love hath a man but that he lay down his life for his friends. So to be crucified in Christ is the highest form of love. And when you are an elderly person, society is not to reject you. You are not useless. You are more valuable than you have ever been. And my friends, that's good news because none of us are getting any younger. And that's part of the church's social teaching. That's part of the doctrinal teaching of the church. That's part of that branch of theology we call soteriology, redemptive theology. And so human dignity, from the moment of conception to the last moment of natural life, every human being, young or old, healthy or sick, has to be respected, has to be respected and accorded their full dignity as human beings and children of God. Solidarity. We're one family in Christ. We have a common Father, God. Every human being that ever was, is now, or ever will be is my brother or my sister. When I see that elderly person in the nursing home or home alone, shut in with no one to visit them, no one to help them, neglected, disregarded, marginalized, shouldn't my heart break? Shouldn't I do something about that? I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. And insofar as I did it for them, I did it for Jesus. And insofar as that I did not do it for them, I did not do it for Jesus. And that's a matter of heaven or hell, life or death, forever. These things are not trivial. These things are the only things that matter. If you gain the whole world, and yet lose your eternal salvation, what does that profit you? Nothing. And so, solidarity with all of humanity. Oh, I've never met most of the people in China or Korea or Iran or any place. But every one of them is my brother and sister. And every one of them has to occupy my concern. And if they are hungry, 
Jesus is hungry. And if they are homeless, Jesus is homeless. And if they are sick, Jesus is sick. And if they are in prison, Jesus is in prison. And what am I going to do about it? And what are you going to do about it? I remember, like it happened yesterday, a meeting I had with Mother Teresa of Calcutta. It was exactly 90 days before she died. I was in Washington, D.C. to preach at the National Basilica. Mother was there to receive the Medal of Freedom, the highest award the United States government bestows on a civilian. I preached, she got the medal. And one of the sisters called me and said, Mother, I'd like you to come and come celebrate Mass over at the convent tomorrow. And I, my flight wasn't until afternoon, so I said, OK. So I went over, come celebrated Mass afterwards. Um, said, Mother, would like to see you. So I said, OK. They took me and put me in a little room. I waited there for a while, and then two sisters brought Mother in wheeled her in a wheelchair, put her across from me at a little table, and they went out. And she looked at me, and she was close to death by then. She was sick. And, and she was, looked very small in that wheelchair. She said, Father, look at me. I said, I'm looking, Mother. Look how little I am. I said, you sure are little. I think you're, you shrunk. <laughs> Look how poor I am. I've been doing this most of my life, and I don't have anything. I, I can pack my entire worldly possessions in a tiny little small bag and go anywhere in the world in five minutes. I said, I know you, you, have, you live evangelical poverty, mother. That's for sure. I know it. And, and Father, look how sick I am. You know, I can't do anything for myself. I'm in this wheelchair. They, they have to feed me several times a day, and, and they have to uh, give me uh, water to drink. I can't do it for myself. And they have to aspirate my lungs several times a day. And now, with a fierce look, she looked at me with this look like an eagle. And she said, now look what God has done with this poor, sick little woman. And I have more than 500 houses all over the world, more than 5,000 sisters all over the world. I have picked up more than 60,000 dying men out of the streets of Calcutta. Look what God has done with one poor, sick little woman. Now you go do the same thing. I've never forgotten it. Charity. Charity and truth. I have to have the love of Christ in order to love my brother and my sister. Charity and truth. If my brother or my sister is going in the wrong direction, if they are doing things which aren't good for them, I have to be concerned about that. If there are things that are happening which are enfeebling their life, especially their spiritual life. I have to be concerned with that under the specious pretext uh, of being accepting or not being morally judgmental or whatever. I fail to tell them what they need to hear. Now, that doesn't mean you pound on them. But if I love them, I have to love them enough to want their eternal salvation. And if I don't think of it in that way, then I'm not thinking of it in the right way. If you have charity, you want what's good for people. And what's best for people is heaven. 
Yes, we should feed them, and yes, we should clothe them, and yes, we should care for them in every way, but above all else, we should want them in heaven. And we should do everything possible to facilitate their journey. When societies institute laws, regulations, systems that are detrimental to the spiritual and material well-being of individual human beings, we have to care about that. And we have a moral obligation to do everything we can to set things right. Subsidiarity. It is a fundamental principle of social philosophy, fixed and unchangeable, the Pope says, that one should not withdraw from individuals and commit to the community what those individuals can accomplish by their own enterprise and industry, the principle of subsidiarity. I went into this before. In other words, the things a person can do for themselves, they should be allowed to do themselves. You should not interpose government at any level, local, state, federal, to do what the individual can do for himself. In other words, if I'm capable of feeding myself and my family, leave me alone. I don't want a handout. I want to work. I want to feed myself. I want to feed my family. That is one of the major principles of Catholic social doctrine, the principle of subsidiarity. Yes, there are occasions where government should step in. They step in, help shore things up, make sure justice is properly administered, then back your butt out. You don't stay there indefinitely. You don't usurp power and make government bigger and bigger and bigger so that it's now government that controls everything and people are a little speck having lost their freedom and enslaved to a system that really doesn't care about them but cares about power. And finally, the fifth principle of Catholic social teaching, distributism. Distributism holds that social and economic structures should promote wide ownership of corporations, which is the basis for antitrust laws and even the stock market. Now, it's a good thing when we can be owners and when you own stock, in a sense, you're an owner of a corporation. However, all these things are predicated upon individual human beings having enough moral fabric to do what's right. So yes, Catholic social teaching encourages wide ownership of the means of production, corporations, companies, and so forth. Uh, so that people can share as widely as possible in the production and in the profits of these enterprises. When things happen like what's happened in the last few years, I mean, major corporations vaporized in the twinkling of an eye, and behind it all, I guarantee you, is corruption and immorality. When I graduated from college in 1973, I got job offers from all of the, what in those days was called the big eight CPA firms. One of them was Arthur Anderson, which became the biggest of the big CPA firms, which in the twinkling of an eye was vaporized, gone. Enron, WorldCom, Bernie Madoff, on and on and on, in rapid succession, people have lost trust, 
Why? Because other people are dishonest and corrupt and very frequently, although they talk big and loud, the politicians facilitated it very frequently, if not participated in it at some level. I saw a bumper sticker when we were coming in to the campus. This morning, I saw a bunch of bumper stickers, and I said, I can tell all these people in the traffic here are going to the conference. <laughs> and one of the bumper stickers said, clean the House and the Senate, too. <laughs> well, I think that's necessary. I think that we need to learn these principles of Catholic social teaching, and I think the Catholic Church needs to be reinvigorated and restored. We have become a sleeping giant, but the giant is about to wake up, I hope. And I think one of the things that can help us to wake up is to learn our faith, and especially learn these elements of Catholic social teaching, because that way, when someone tries to distort them, you'll recognize it, you know? You don't have to have a doctorate degree in theology to recognize an error. My grandmother had an eighth grade education, and I'll guarantee you that if she heard some of the things that have been bandied about in recent years, she, she'd have busted them. She would have recognized it. If you have an ear for music, you recognize a discordant note. If you have an ear for the truth, you will recognize a discordant note in the symphony of truth. Learn your faith. Live your faith. And I promise you, one day, you'll hear those beautiful words. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Now at last, enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you.